time this morning explaining the motivation for parallelism. It's pretty much everywhere. And one of the things that makes it a joy these days is that uh, dual core is sort of passing by the wayside and we're seeing uh, quad cores become extremely common and uh, obviously we have uh, machines with many more cores than four these days. Um, so for a software developer, the, the um, possibilities of getting, um, seeing benefits from writing a threaded or a multi-threaded uh, multi program taking advantage of parallelism are more substantial than they were five years ago. In fact, it's pretty much any device you buy today um, is going to be multi-core. So that's a pretty strong motivation to take advantage of this. But our traditional programming methods, our traditional tools, our traditional programming languages weren't written with multi-core or with multi-processors in mind. Um, and that's where we need to step in and help with tools and models. So our tools group at Intel uh, is able to help uh, primarily three big thrusts that we have product lines we have uh, for parallelism. We have Intel Parallel Studio that really takes a step at, at helping with the essential performance, with the performance that is needed uh, for Windows development aimed at multi-core. Um, it's worth mentioning, I'm not going to go and uh, talk about these today in this talk, but we have a line of tools that stretch up into very large machines, advanced performance, distributed performance. Um, in these cases, we start talking about dozens of processor cores on up to hundreds and thousands. Our distributed performance tools um, routinely are used in machines with thousands of processors. So we have a lot of experience with parallelism um, across the spectrum. I think a very hot topic, a very interesting topic, is how do we distill this knowledge and experience down into um, helping with the essential performance challenges of someone targeting a machine that may be quad core. So that's what Intel Parallel Studio in 2011 is about. Um, it's about helping with um, uh, getting performance and doing it on a schedule that uh, uh, helps keep a software development product uh, project on on its schedule while adding parallelism. So what we've done is introduce a tool set um, with four major areas in mind. Um, how do we help in the design phase? Um, and this is something that uh, we included only in a beta or a light version with the original Parallel Studio. I'm very excited to have uh, Intel Parallel Advisor, a full product now, help there to help with the design phase. Um, Parallel Composer, which is compilers, libraries, um, debug uh, extensions to the Microsoft Debugger to help with the um, when you're building debugging. Uh, and next up is Inspector that can help um, find um, sources of errors, deadlocks, race conditions. Uh, traditionally, this has been something where you just hoped you could guess where these bugs were coming from because no tool could find them directly. But uh, Parallel Inspector um, has been a big hit um, uh, because it's able to find directly where our sources of deadlock and race conditions come from, take you right to the source code line, um, and help make uh, the source of an error like that obvious. Um, and that can keep a project on schedule. Uh, a bug that used to be mysterious and, and just had to be found by trial and error now can be found directly, so the debugging a parallel application is a tractable problem. Finally, Intel Parallel Amplifier for the tuning phase of understanding what's really going on in the machine. This can give you insight into things you can't see. You can't see how well uh, your program is distributing across multiple cores without a tool like this and this tool. So together, we're helping with the, the whole problem of writing a parallel program, not just adding a few clever extensions to a language and calling it done and hoping you have fun with it, but rather uh, addressing the whole cycle. We present this as a plug-in to Visual Studio. Um, it's a, uh, we support Visual Studio 2005, 2008, and now uh, the new 2010, which was uh, not out at the time that we released the original Parallel Studio last year, but um, we offer the choice of plugging into whatever environment you use. Um, if you want to get a copy of this to evaluate and so forth, uh, intel.com slash go slash parallels is the place to go. Um, we have a pretty liberal evaluation policy to help you uh, 
see that it works for you. So I mentioned the design cycle, but overlaying all of this is the uh, parallel models. So we've taken Intel threading building blocks as a foundation, something that we introduced some time ago, um, and we've uh, extended it in some logical fashions. And I'll talk a little bit more about why, what we saw as motivating of this, but we, we pulled this together in something we call Intel parallel building blocks. And parallel building blocks is made up of Intel threading building blocks, Intel silk plus, Intel array building blocks. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail in a bit about what each of those are and why they're very exciting. But this helps a software developer programming in C or C++ implement parallelism at the right level of abstraction without getting down in the details that um, are too tied to the hardware, too difficult to write, uh, maintain, don't hold up over time. Instead, these are um, the right level of abstractions. And then we follow that up with uh, the tools I was talking about. Um, the very exciting addition Intel Parallel Amplifier. Um, we also back this up with support, a year of updates. Um, we also announced that anyone that had the original version of Intel Parallel Studio um, will get a free update to uh, Intel Parallel Studio 2011 uh, available to them. Um, so we back it up with support and with updates. And of course, it's got the latest compilers, the latest uh, threading building blocks, all incorporated in it, and integration to Visual Studio 2010. Now let me say a few things about Advisor. So, Intel Parallel Advisor, and Wolf will give us a demo of this at the end. It's a very exciting um, tool to, to use. What we see when people have an existing program and say, hey, I want to add some parallelism to it is you know your program, um, you think you know where to add parallelism to it, so you go start coding. And that may take a while. Um, maybe it's a weekend effort, but more often I've heard people talk about coding off and on for a week or two and then doing some debugging and who knows, maybe after a month of prototyping, not, not full time, maybe it only takes you a few days full time, but you're doing another job at the same time, you can't quite get the program to work. Either it doesn't scale or it doesn't perform well. This is a story I hear over and over again. And it's usually because you didn't quite pick the right place to put the, the parallel directives or didn't quite understand the data structures or didn't think about it. And then you keep messing around with it until you get it running pretty well. well we thought, well, what can we do to speed up that prototyping phase? So that's what Parallel Advisor about, is about. It gives step-by-step -step advice um, and does some analysis. And I think this is a very exciting tool to, to look at a demo of because it's a very practical answer to what can tools do to help you add parallelism. Um, you start, it, it, it has a five-step program. Um, you start by um, getting some candidates of where you probably want to add the parallelism, some insight into the call stack so that you can pick the right level to put your parallel for or your tasking in. Uh, and then it steps you through. You, you can estimate the performance gain. You can check for performance issues. You can get some great speed ups if you don't care about correctness of your program. Um, but the correctness will, will bring you back to reality and tell you what locks you may need to put in and so forth. Um, and after you get through all of that, uh, then you can actually go code it up. Because Parallel Advisor doesn't require that you actually go write an actual mutex lock or a TBB lock. It doesn't require that you exactly write the format out for Parallel 4. You just tell it that you intend to do that, um, and it's able to do its estimations for you. It's a very exciting addition to, uh, to the tool. Also in Parallel Studio is our compiler and libraries. We call it Intel Parallel Composer. Um, this is not uh, what we believe to be the highest performance compiler available for C and C++, um, with lots of exciting features in it for optimization, including um, capabilities for parallelism. Um, and it comes with uh, a library as well, integrated performance primitives, to handle a lot of common multimedia operations uh, for you with very high performance. Parallel Inspector, this is the tool that can look at a running program and tell you where there are possible deadlocks and race conditions. Uh, 
I say possible because your program doesn't need to be failing for it to tell you that you have a race condition. Race conditions are bad. Um, they, they may not be failing right now, but uh, you certainly want to worry about them failing when your customer gets the code, so, or your users. Um, so it can tell you about that. Um, and it's proven itself to be a very, uh, very reliable, useful tool for a lot of, uh, a lot of software development. Um, very commonly, I hear people skeptical of the tool when they haven't used it, and then I hear high praise for it afterwards. And there are a lot of companies we work with um, um, that use the tool that won't release a product without running our tool on it now. In fact, I'd say that'd be the majority of our users tell me that. Uh, once they figure out how easy it is to use and realize what protection it's giving them by uh, analyzing a program, they can't imagine shipping a program without um, having a parallel inspector take a look at it and tell them that the, the race conditions and deadlocks are gone. And then finally, tuning. If you've got a quad core, you'd like your program to be running on all four cores. And it's kind of amazing the things that can get in the way. But uh, having a tool that can directly show you um, how the program is doing, how many cores it's running on, how efficiently that's happening is invaluable. It also has something called the locks and weight analysis that really helps with a key problem with parallel programming, which is that you put these locks in to provide synchronization. And uh, if, if some of them are highly contested, that means that threads are waiting on them. Uh, you want to know about that, and Parallel Amplifier is able to give you some timing information about locks and tell you which ones are actually being waited on. Because a lock is no big deal if nobody's waiting for it. You're, you're doing it, it provides safety, who cares? But if you put a lock in a part of the program and lots of threads are spending time just idly waiting for that lock to be released, you'd like to know about that. You can quite frequently restructure your program or algorithm a bit to get around that. This is the tool to tell you about it. Now that's a really quick overview of the tools, and they really are um, a joy to work with and uh, a remarkable addition to, uh, to Parallels. Um, Parallel Studio is a remarkable addition to Visual Studio to give these capabilities. I want to talk a bit about uh, the parallel programming models that we have, um, because these are a very important aspect of programming at the right level. So the tools that I mentioned will work with these programming models. They'll also work if you've coded things up using uh, uh, pthreads or with Windows threads directly, whatever threading model. Uh, one of the things that's very special about our tools are that they're constructed to handle parallelism in a very general sense. So no matter how you've introduced it or how a library that you've purchased and included in your code, um, no matter how that's introducing parallelism or the operating systems, doing some uh, things with your program to produce parallelism. All the tools I mentioned will work with you and can do their analysis work. They're not wed to a particular parallel programming model. But I think it's very important to advocate programming in, in uh, ways that, uh, that lead to success more often because they're at the right level, um, that are more debuggable, more maintainable. And so we do handle a wide variety. Um, we've got some research projects going on. Uh, we've been longtime supporters of message passing uh, interface API, OpenMP, uh, supporters of the OpenCL initiatives. Uh, our libraries, integrated performance primitives, math parallel libraries, all of these can express parallelism. But we've decided to um, focus and extend in a uh, area of of programming models that are uh, extensible, maintainable, that have um, a lot going for them. And we call that area Intel Parallel Building Blocks. And Intel Parallel Building Blocks uh, really, um, as its foundation, um, uses Intel Threading Building Blocks, which we introduced um, uh, in 2006. It's been very popular, very widely used. Um, but Intel Threading Building Blocks is a template library in C++. And there are other things that we thought we could do. So one area was we thought we can do um, more with the compiler, that the compiler could be more of an assistant, um, and that we could make uh, 
programming, parallel programming, a little bit easier to understand by introducing keywords and some extensions to C and C++. So we introduced Intel Silk Plus. Um, about a year ago, uh, we acquired a company uh, called Silk Arts out on the East Coast. Um, fantastic group of people, technology, uh, research and products that date back into the mid-90s at MIT. Um, it's time to deploy this, deploy it in a commercial compiler, deploy it in a very serious sense. And, uh, so we introduced Intel Silk Plus, very powerful um, capabilities there. I like to think of it as the compilers on your side. Um, so there's some very unique things it can do um, uh, where the compiler is helping you and it's very simple, straightforward. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the other area we looked at is what can we do for data parallelism? Data parallelism is uh, a very compelling area to look at. Um, a lot of our parallelism in Intel threading building blocks is focused on uh, task parallelism. Now, there's data parallelism there too, parallel fours and so forth, and a lot of people would say they use threading building blocks for data parallelism. But threading building blocks doesn't take parallelism to an extreme. It doesn't understand how to spread it across SIMD instructions and multi-core simultaneously. You have to do that manually. So we took a direct look at that and included some features in Silk Plus and an entire project called Intel Array Building Blocks aimed at this problem of data parallelism. Um, and the simplest way to think about it is for the first time we're offering some capabilities where you just express your math straightforward and the tools will automatically spread it across SIMD instructions, um, things like SSE and AVX and multi-core simultaneously in hopefully the optimal fashion, but you're not rewriting your code to represent how to decompose into multiple loops to do that. This is really powerful and worth taking a look at. Um, there's no reason why you can't just say A equals B times C um, and get the performance from uh, a SSE, AVX instructions, and multi-core. Uh, we can uh, show you two ways to do that, one with array building box, one with silver. So, let me talk about each of these in turn a little bit. Intel Threading Building Blocks has been a joy to work with. We introduced this in 2006, we open sourced it in 2007, it's been ported to many, many platforms. Um, it's become by far the uh, most used extraction for parallel programming uh, in C++. Uh, ThreadingBuildingBlocks.org is a great website to go to to jump off and get copies of it, uh, look around, uh, read what the people are uh, saying. Um, we have an in-depth talk about it by Victoria and Pablo uh, later today um, at 3.20 in this room uh, to more fully explore all the features of it. Um, I got involved um, in the project early on and wrote a book on it. Also a very popular joy. This book is uh, available in multiple languages. The book's been popular, the tools have been popular. Uh, companies like uh, Autodesk, um, with their Maya product, uh, introduced usage of threading building blocks very early on. We've had many other companies, including recently Adobe, a uh, new creative suite, um, Five, uh, uses threading building blocks for its parallelism. So as many companies have adopted this over the course of the, uh, the last four or five years, um, it's been very successful. Um, quite often get calls from people that say, I finally took a look at it, and wow, this is amazing. So um, I think the reason that people like it so much is that it, it tackled all the aspects of what was wrong with C++ for parallelism. And the reason anything's wrong in C++ is it wasn't designed for parallelism. So it didn't have algorithm mix support, which we added. It doesn't have a portable lock and, and uh, atomic operation scheme, which threading building block solves. Um, STL, the standard template library, is not thread safe all the time. So we solve that with some additions. Um, uh, memory allocation uh, is often a bottleneck because usually the memory allocators out there, you can't rely on them being thread safe. Threading building block solves that. All in a highly compatible, portable uh, way with C++. Now, Silk Plus, I mentioned before, is a set of extensions to the C and C++ language um, implemented in the Intel compiler. 
No. I fully hope that in the future some other compilers will implement these, but we just released it in the Intel compiler a few weeks ago, so we're very excited about that. And it's based on research that dates back into the mid-90s in MIT, um, and a lot has been learned in the past decade. Um, and so guards have taken some implementations, worked with customer feedback. We've been in this area. So we're really excited about this. There's a couple of talks that uh, touch on this in more depth today. And of course, we're down at the technology showcase. Um, Noah is going to talk about the data parallel aspects at uh, 210. And then uh, Pablo and Victoria's talk will talk more about the, uh, the task-oriented aspects of both of these. Um, of Silk Plus. It's, Silk Plus is really easy to, to, um, to just explain by showing. Three keywords were added to the language. Um, they do two different things. The first keyword is Silk 4. You take a 4 loop and you change the keyword from 4 to Silk 4. And there are a few rules like the iterations of the loop need to be independent. Uh, and they, the uh, bounds don't change, but um, those are pretty straightforward, and uh, it's very easy to change a program. The program stays the same size, it stays very readable, the syntax doesn't change as much as it does if you use threading building blocks. Um, very straightforward uh, utilization here. Um, that's one keyword is silk4, and the other two keywords are silk spawn and silk sync. And you just put them in front of uh, a function call. And all of it, all it really means is go make this function call, but don't wait for it to return. Silk sync says let's wait until all the spawns you know, conclude. Um, so a simple example of Fibonacci number reduction here um, can be done. And, and here I've shown on the left-hand side original code, the way I would write it for Fibonacci computer Fibonacci number of function. On the right hand side, I show what it'll look like after you introduce the silk keywords. And one of the silk keywords isn't necessary if you're really following the code. The second silk spawn, you could leave that out and it would be functionally the same because you don't really need it to run off in parallel. But uh, it actually doesn't matter whether you include it or not uh, performance wise. So three simple keywords, pretty easy to teach. The other thing that's uh, really novel and, and came out of some work Silk Arts did with customers is um, if all you do is add those three keywords, one other ugly problem crops up very quickly and often, which is that you have global data that is excessively shared. So if you're doing like going through a vector of numbers and summing up the numbers, or if you're scanning a set of numbers for the minimum number in an array, you often have a global variable, or at least a shared variable, um, that you're updating quite often. Um, if you divide up across multiple cores and everybody's updating the same variable, you'll, you'll get a bottleneck pretty quickly. The way to solve this is something called reductions. It's a reduction operator, and what you do is you create a, a, a private copy of that shared data uh, for each task, for each thread of execution. So if you're on a quad core, you create four copies. And then you combine them at the end. If you're doing a sum, you would sum up the four temporary copies. The problem is, is that the silk keywords I showed you, the silk four, the silk one, they say nothing about how many processors there are. We purposefully don't have the programmer involved in deciding how many tasks and threads to kick off because we want to keep that um, under the control of the, the runtime so that it can adapt to the hardware, the availability of processors. Um, even if you're on a quad core, you don't necessarily want to evenly distribute things across four cores. One of the cores might be running some virus detector and it's completely useless to get work done. So you, you want to distribute the things dynamically. So you don't want the programmer hardcore coding on a quad core to four, four, to four threads. Well then, how on earth do you break up a variable into four pieces? And the answer is something we call a hyper object. And the hyper object just says, hey, I've got this variable. I would have shared it. I want to use it in a reduction operator. And you just declare that using this hyper pointer. Um, and then you, you change the access to the variable very slightly using this get value. 
Um, it's a very easy transformation to do, and magically your program doesn't have that shared variable. Um, one of the things, you know, that obvious appeal here is, again, you're not expanding the program in a gross way, you're not changing the way you would have written it in a serial fashion. You're adding a little bit of these uh, things effectively as annotations that allow your program to run in parallel very efficiently. Um, now, the other thing we added that was not in um, the original SIL uh, are array notations. And these are very powerful for um, helping you write data parallel operations and get the performance out of SIMD and out of multi-core. Um, We've extended the language a little, and an example of it's down below. I've got y equals a times x. Um, y and x are, um, are um, matrices, and, um, or vectors, rather, and we're multiplying by a scalar a. That will automatically be taken by our compiler and vectorized to take advantage of SIMD and ABX. Uh, or it's uh, SSE and AVX and I'll send the instructions and it'll take advantage of multi-core and it understands blocking and caching and all these magical things behind the scenes um, to do that optimally and your source code stays this instead of being unrolled. Um, I think I was uh, talking with one of the guys that, that uh, often consults with customers last night at dinner and, uh, a common question was, well, what's the most optimized code, you know, to submit to your compilers and such? And we said, well, do you have the original code before you started hand optimizing your C? Because that's usually the code to go back to and make minor modifications to to get the best performance today. Um, and Y equals A times X is probably similar to the code that was originally written. Um, and then if you've actually tried optimizing for SIMD instructions and for multi-core, you've added loops and you've unrolled and you've done uh, some loop splitting or uh, different techniques, just go back to the, the code. So I'm very excited about this um, addition because it makes, it, it divides the problem up properly. You do the coding of the algorithm at a very high level and then let the tools, the compilers, libraries take um, uh, advantage of that for you. And then array building blocks takes it to a new extreme. Now, array building blocks is able to help with that same problem, but we're able to do it um, uh, in a more controlled fashion, so we can, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more work to use it, but the extra control that your uh, constraints that you live under will guarantee safety. No deadlocks, no race conditions if you write using array building blocks. Um, also, it can handle sparse uh, in irregular matrices, which um, are incredibly important in some applications. So this is, uh, uh, this is a big deal, array building blocks. Um, and again, it can really get you that performance capable of SIMD instructions and from uh, uh, multi-core. And it does something we, we call future-proofing, which is we're asking you to write the code in such a fashion that it's going to apply to machines far into the future. It's not, you're not coding at a level tied too closely to the way the architecture looks today. You're staying pretty generic, um, and that means that we'll be able to compile it for future architectures without going back and revisiting it. Array building blocks does, I said, create a constraint, a tired of constraint on you, and that is, is that it only operates on variables that are in its space, in the array building block space. So you declare some variables, and in order to operate on them, you need to copy the values into them, and copy them out. Um, it's a pretty simple concept. The picture shows it pretty well. Variables to be operated on it need to be declared in that space, and you have to get the values in. Um, the benefits of this is that uh, it will work on multi-core. It also is tied into our uh, many integrated core initiative in Intel to bring forward some attach processing capability that some of you uh, may be familiar with. Um, and this, this particular language uh, capability, this programming model fits very, very well uh, with NIC as well.